you were invited to speak at this uh, parliamentary committee on Canada-China relations. What were your key recommendations on how this relationship should function? Mm -hmm. As someone who's gone through intimidation and harassment tactics of the Chinese government here on Canadian soil, uh, one of the things that we've asked for is a focal point for uh, activists and advocates for human rights to go to uh, when they need support. Two, it's also to implement legislation to counter covert Chinese government interferences that are similar to Australia and the U.S. And ultimately, I really was there to encourage the Canadian government and all Canadians to understand the insidious ways the Chinese government is trying to, you know, strive for global domination. Now, you've brought up a number of points there, and I do want to get back to them. But one of the key things that came up during the meeting, not only from you, but from a couple of the other people who were speaking, was a concern about the prime minister bringing up the issue of anti-Asian racism um, and sort of using that as a way to avoid critically looking at the Chinese government. What exactly were your concerns about what the PM had to say? This is in regards to the PM, but also to the government as a whole, right? Any government official that holds their tongue when speaking against the human rights atrocities, the brutal human rights record of the Chinese government, uh, to supposedly prevent some sort of racial violence is a false trade-off, actually, for, both, for Asian, um, Asian Canadians and the Uyghurs, the Tibetan lives that are, you know, suffering back home. So this is... For me, it's a non-negotiable. The fact that there are people suffering, it means that we should be acting. So why do you think it is that not just the prime minister, but other Western leaders are so reluctant to criticize China? The first answer is trade and economy. You know, money talks. However, for me, I think that this is a false sense of there's a false sense of how much it's going to affect our uh, economy. You know, Canada has a long-standing relationship with China, and if governments alike with like-minded democracies come together in a multilateral forum to hold China accountable, it actually won't affect us as much as we think it would. And number two, is trade and economy really worth the human rights violations and people dying and being killed and the genocide that is happening currently in our, in Tibet, in East Turkestan, and the assault on democracy at in Hong Kong? I don't think so. Jimmy, the issue that often comes up is that when a Western government criticizes the Chinese government, it comes across as perhaps being racist. And this comes up not only with China's governmental policies, but even at the way that one is examining the COVID spread. And when one talks about the lab theory, this conversation came up just last week right here on our network, where the possibility that perhaps COVID might have come from a lab, the, the possibility is out there. And yet the pushback was, well, this is very anti-Asian racism to discuss the topic. Why, what do you think is the damage that is done by bringing up the issue of racism when talking about the Chinese government? And we can't let an injustice silence another injustice. What is happening inside of China while, you know, holding them accountable for COVID-19 and the spread of COVID-19, um, but also holding them accountable for the human rights abuses against the Uyghurs, the Hong Kongers and the Tibetans, must continue. It does not come off as a, a trade-off, right? It's not one or the other. It must be both. And actually, if folks are committed to uh, addressing anti-Asian hatred and racism, I think it's time that we center the voices of the Asian folks. I'm telling you, as an Asian woman myself, as a Tibetan Canadian, I, I every day I worry about my brothers and sisters, my siblings, my family members back home inside of Tibet, whom we don't have access to, the Uyghurs that are getting surveilled here on Canadian soil while we are getting racist threats. So it's not a trade-off. We must be acting in, in both accounts. Uh, I can't talk to you about the relationship of Canada and China and not bring up the issue of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, who are Canadian citizens who have been held by the Chinese authorities for... Uh, I, I don't even now know how long, over two years, quite possibly. And is there a concern that, that perhaps if the Canadian government is too critical of China, that China will take punitive actions against those two men? Thank you for raising them. There are the two Michaels. There's also Hussein Cecil, who is a Uyghur Canadian that has been imprisoned inside of China. So it's important that we talk about all three of them. However, this concept of quiet diplomacy 
is not going to work. We've seen for three decades now, you know, uh, back in 2008 when Olympics was held in Beijing, the Tibetans rose and it came onto the news. However, now there's now as we come move towards the time of 2020, uh, 2020 uh, Beijing Olympics, it's not just the Tibetans, it's the East Turkestan Uyghurs, the Hong Kongers, the Taiwanese. People are rising and telling us to wake up. And I think it's time for Canada, not just Canada, but the world to wake up and understand that China is not someone, an authoritarian government is not someone that we want to have quiet diplomacy with. It's someone that we need to have a multilateral forum and take action against. Jimmy, you know that if a representative from the Chinese government watches this conversation, they're going to say that you are spreading anti-Chinese propaganda, that what you're saying is basically untrue, and the argument often that comes from the Chinese government is that they are functioning within the rules and legality and mores of that particular country. Why should they have to abide by the rules and norms of the Western world when they are not part of the Western world? Why do they want to host the Beijing Olympics? That's a seal of approval. They're looking for legitimacy all the time, right? And that's besides the point. Inside of Tibet, the current president, Xi Jinping, is hell-bent on destroying our Tibetan identity. You know, we've uh, international researchers have referred to it as a cradle-to-grave system of displacement, control, and cultural erasure. And there's an information blackout. You know, we are struggling to find information of what's happening back home. Freedom House recently just reported that Tibet is actually the least free place on earth in tied with Syria. That's higher than actually North Korea. And that says something about what the Chinese government is hell-bent on trying to do. Some have compared this to a Cold War that this is a war of propaganda, of mixed messaging, um, political power plays. And from your point of view, if the Western world, if Western governments, including our own, doesn't hold China to account, does not take more aggressive lines against the Chinese government and human rights abuses and other issues, what do you think is at risk? What is the worst case scenario? Our democracy. The one thing that we cherish very much here in the West, I think, um, like I said earlier, you know, it was the Tibetans first uh, rising up and telling the world about it. Now we have the Uyghurs, the Hong Kongers, the Taiwanese. We also see Chinese governments, you know, luring into parts of India, seaports in Sri Lanka, different parts of Africa. In, in Canada, too, we talk about the long-arm tactics of the Chinese government. They're talking about propaganda, but what I went through in 2019 was harassment, state um, driven harassment and intimidation tactics, death threats and rape threats against a student who was running for student elections. Jimmy Lamo is a Tibetan activist joining us from Toronto. You're watching CBC News Network.